Become a Better Safety Leader in 2023, sponsored by Alert Media. Moderating will be Katie Going, uh, Going Senior Producer of Content Marketing at Alert Media. For more about Katie and our speakers, check out the speaker details tab on your console. Welcome, Katie. And with that, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Nicole, for that warm welcome. And hello, everyone. I will be another one of your moderators today. And I'm really looking forward to this webinar. I've been looking forward to it for weeks because of the experience and expertise of today's guests, but also because of all the fantastic questions that you submitted in advance. So thank you so much for that. And we're here today to talk about safety leadership and how to be a better EHS leader. So as you guys know firsthand, being an EHS leader in today's environment is complex, to put it lightly, but hopefully today's conversation can help. So with that, I would love to introduce you to today's speakers. First, we have our featured expert today, who is Eric McNulty. He is Associate Director and Program Faculty at the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative at Harvard University and an instructor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So Eric is a widely published business author, speaker, and researcher, and he's the co-author of a book called You're It, Crisis, Change, and How to Lead When It Matters Most, and he's also written more than 200 bylined articles and top publications. He teaches multiple executive education programs and graduate level courses on leadership, negotiation, and conflict resolution at Harvard. So we are definitely in good hands today. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for being here. Katie, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. Well, we also have Peter Steinfeld with us today. He's going to help set the stage up top for why EHS, EHS leaders are experiencing so much change in their roles lately. And he's also going to help moderate the questions later in the presentation. So a little bit about Peter. He has been involved in the emergency communications industry for more than 20 years. He is the Senior Vice President of Safety Solutions at Alert Media, so he works closely with all types of organizations to support their emergency preparedness, employee safety, and business continuity initiatives. He's also the host of Alert Media's weekly podcast series, The Employee Safety Podcast. So he interviews subject matter experts in safety from major organizations and agencies. And really fun facts, Eric was a guest on the show last fall for a special episode on National Preparedness Month. So definitely check that out when you get a chance. But back to you, Peter. Thank you so much for being here today. Glad you could join us. Absolutely. Glad to be here. And I appreciate everyone taking the time to participate over the next hour. Excellent. Well, I do want to go ahead and take a minute to go over today's agenda, um, just so we kind of know what to expect over the next hour or so. So first, we're going to talk about the role of the EHS leader and the different types of challenges you guys are facing in the, the current environment. We're going to talk about the meta leadership framework, what that is and how you can apply it. We'll go over some common leadership mistakes and how to avoid them. And then finally, the Ask the Expert section of this webinar. So for those of you who did submit questions upon registration, thank you again. We have incorporated a lot of those into the slides, and then some others are incorporated into that Ask an Expert section. And as Nicole said, you can ask a question now at any time using the, um, the question box here on the platform. So after the questions, a special treat is in store for you, so make sure you stick around for that. But right now, I want to go ahead and launch our first poll. So this is just going to help us kind of get a feel for the discussion today and give us all an idea of where everyone's at. So if you could take a minute to answer the question on your screen, how confident are you currently in your ability to lead your workforce through organizational changes or crises? So you could maybe feel extremely confident, confident, neutral, not confident, or maybe you're not currently a safety leader, but you just would like some more information to get you on that path. So I'm going to give that just another second or two, if you could go ahead and get your answers in. And then what I'm going to do is share these results so we can get just a, a peek at where everyone is currently. So let me send those results. All right. Can everyone see that? Perfect. So it looks like most of our folks are saying confidence. 
So that is a fantastic thing to hear, but I can also see that every answer is represented here. So we do have folks kind of across the board. So Eric, are, any thoughts on that? Is, it, is that about what you were expecting to see? I think it's really good to see. The two, the two answers that worry me are not confident at all and extremely confident. If you're overconfident, mm -hmm. that's a problem as well. So, but we, our research has shown that confidence is incredibly important to leader effectiveness and being able to rally your team. Excellent. Well, that is a very good point. Well, what I'm going to do now, guys, is go ahead and turn it over to Peter, because he's going to talk about uh, the evolving roles of EHS leaders and why so many changes are taking place. So, Peter, you can take it away. Absolutely. Thank you, Katie. And yeah, let's definitely start by talking about how the roles of EHS leaders have changed uh, recently. Um, I have heard from many of our customers uh, a lot of our partners and even podcast guests in EHS leadership roles that they've experienced a huge shift in their purviews in the last few years. They're still responsible for duties like complying with agency regulations, uh, overseeing site and equipment inspections, and conducting safety meetings or trainings, but their scope has really expanded. And I'm sure many of you here today have experienced this as well. Um, these days, it's not just about keeping your on-site employees physically safe from harm, like it has been historically, now it's more about keeping a hybrid workforce, both physically and psychologically safe from harm. And that's a lot for you to be accountable for and requires a lot of additional tools and skill sets. And you're already wearing so many hats and are now expected to be experts in new areas. And that's difficult. Uh, now, unfortunately, even though you're taking on more responsibility, it doesn't mean you have more to work with. Many of you are relying on the same or perhaps even less resources, budget, and technology. Uh, in fact, our host, EHS Today, uncovered in their 2022 National Safety and Salary Survey that safety leaders are indeed increasingly being asked to do more with less. So that really begs the question, why is that? Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, first is the global threat landscape continues to intensify, and the number of disasters and crises that involve people are increasing both in impact and frequency. Uh, there's also a much stronger likelihood of concurrent emergencies or disasters these days. Just think back to COVID when you had hurricanes and other things overlapping it. Um, second, the pandemic shined a very bright spotlight on the importance of mental health and well-being in the workplace, resulting in a really heightened focus on the psychological safety of workers. And then lastly, many organizations are experiencing labor or economic issues, like attracting and retaining talent, uh, rising costs due to inflation, and even layoffs. So this means that many safety teams are lean or understaffed. Going back to that EHS Today survey that I mentioned just a little bit ago, they asked 1,100 safety professionals what the biggest workplace challenge was that they faced last year, and by far the most common answer was a need for more staff, more employees, more resources, and more support. So it's pretty common out there. Now, moving forward, it's crucial that you learn to adapt to these organizational changes and broader scope of responsibility that you now have. When it comes to doing more with less, you simply can't lead the same way that you always have before. Changes in responsibility absolutely mean changes in your approach to leadership. And look, we know it's not easy. In fact, it's incredibly difficult. Uh, we hear it all the time and we certainly empathize, uh, but there really is no secret sauce, for lack of a better term, for being a great EHS leader um, in the new environment that we find ourselves in, which is why we've partnered with Eric and NPLI to shed some light on this topic. Uh, NPLI has been at the forefront of leadership practice and research for 20 years. They prepare individuals to lead more effectively and with a lot greater confidence, going back to what Eric said before, super important, uh, during all sorts of crises and uh, change situations. So you're absolutely in great hands today. All right. Well, Eric, I know you guys have a tried and true framework that can help our audience adapt and even thrive in their roles. So can you jump into that? Absolutely, Peter, and thank you. And I think you set the context so well. I think for many, many years, being a safety leader meant being the subject matter expert in safety. And now it needs much more than that. You have to think more broadly about organizational behavior, individual and social resilience, all kinds of topics. And so that's something we call meta leadership, where meta is a prefix meaning to take the broad view. So you're not just looking within your function of, of safety, but you're seeing both the broader organizational context, the larger ecosystem, including your suppliers, your customers, all the stakeholders in your value chain, and then the larger social context in which you're operating. Because when you can take that broad view and see the different factors at play, you find many more points of leverage, you may find many more points of influence to get to the best possible outcome. 
So when we talk about meta leadership, it is a, a way of, of thinking about your role and not just sort of the traditional thinking of leadership with a team, but you as a leader bringing people together to, on a, to a common cause to try and achieve shared objectives. So that means understanding what motivates them as well as what motivates yourself, what their goals are, incorporating your goals into that. And to do it, you know, we draw upon a, a wide range of, of specialties. So we, yes, we look at the leadership literature, uh, that's helpful, but we dive, delve into neuroscience and psychology and the other ones you see here listed on the, on the slide to try and create a really holistic view of what it means to lead in today's context. And when we talk about leading, and I like to use the verb leading here because it is something you do, you know, we look at what's the only evidence that you're leading. And that is that people are following you. So I don't care what your title is or where you went to school or how many degrees you have, are people following you? So when you walk into the room, do they say he or she has, you know, is worth paying attention to? This is the direction we're going to go. And so that's what meta leadership is meant to do. And on our next slide, you'll see that, you know, we've broken the meta leadership down into three dimensions. We've intentionally made this uh, a simple framework under which you, which is useful for preparing yourself but also diagnosing things when they aren't going as well as you'd hope. So in the center of that symbol there on the, on the screen is the person. That's you as a leader. Not 27 things you have to check off from a standardized list, but you, how you inhabit the role of safety leader. And if I could see all of you right now, I would easily be uh, visible that you are different. You're different ages, you're different genders, you're different heights and weights, you're different ethnicities. And if I can look more deeply, you're different birth orders, you have different backgrounds and expertise. You're different in many, many ways. And so you will come to that role of safety leader in a very individual way. You will inhabit it differently than I will or Katie would or Peter would uh, because you're a distinct individual. And so being the meta leader, calls on you to understand yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses, your areas to grow, uh, the reasons people want to follow you, all the things that make you a distinct individual, how you show up. You know, when you walk into the room, are you a trusted advisor? Are you credible, reliable, uh, a good person to work alongside, invested in the larger mission? Those things all give you influence. And so how you show up is very, very important. And then you are in the situation that's that larger red circle on the screen. That's the context in which you're operating. You know, are you in a traditionally high risk industry like aviation or energy? Or are you someplace where, you know, safety is not quite so obvious why it's important, even though it's, it's very important everywhere? Are you in a, uh, an industry where things are going well and you're growing and everyone's happy with the business or are things a bit more turbulent as they are for a lot of industries these days between inflation and concerns about talent and all kinds of other you know, political divisions in society, our contexts tend to be fairly turbulent. So understanding that situation and being able to discern what's happening positively, negatively, where do you have the most influence, that's critical when you show up. And then when we think about leading, we think about connectivity. This is where we think beyond just leading down to your team, which is really important. You know, when you're the boss and you're trying to build a great safety team, that's really, really important. But you're also going to have to lead up. You're accountable to someone who in turn is accountable to someone else. We saw a lot of this in your, in your questions that came in. How do I lead up to uh, the CEO, to the board, to uh, other me members of senior management? That's a critical part of your role and place where you can have great influence. And then, of course, a lot of safety is leading across and beyond. And by across, I mean the different units, divisions within your organization. So outside of your organizational function of safety, you obviously are, are trying to bring about the, the positive results with the operating divisions, with the support units, all the other parts of your organization, and then beyond are external stakeholders. We can't forget them. I have found in organizations that have a true safety culture, they're thinking about the families of employees, they're thinking about customers, they're thinking about the general public that may have an interaction with their product or their people. They're really concerned and looking for how can we improve safety overall for, the, for that larger group, because that's what really brings culture deep into the DNA of any given organization. So again, three dimensions, the person, the situation and connectivity. It's a great way to think of where are things going well, where am I strong, where do I need to work on things and strengthen them further. And if you're in a situation and things aren't going well, 
it's a great diagnostic. Am I showing up as the right person? Do I really understand what's going on? And then how are the relationships in the system? As a safety leader, you need to be a relationship master, uh, building across beyond uh, the organization all the time. Next slide, please. So when everything is going well, that's great. Um, but there are some mistakes we see, and we're going to break them down into uh, operational mistakes and then leadership mistakes. And I think that, you know, uh, there are pitfalls out there. And the most effective leaders we see, they always have their eyes open. They're looking a little bit beyond, uh, over the horizon, trying to see what's coming next. And they're always in learning mode. You know, one of the people I got to, I've gotten to work with over the years is Admiral Thad Allen. He's the retired commandant of the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, the public knows him largely for uh, taking over the response to Hurricane Katrina down in the Gulf, and then again in the Gulf when he was uh, National Incident Commander for the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And I was able to deploy during that event and be there with the Coast Guard and others. And Admiral Allen, one of the things I like about him so much was that even when he had four stars on his shoulder, he had a national reputation. He would still come to our classroom. He would come speak at Harvard occasionally, but he'd always get there early and stay late listening to the speakers before him and after him. And he said, I've always got more to learn. I'm always you know, trying to bring more things into my, my leadership toolkit. And that's how we all have to think. Uh, that's how you begin to spot the mistakes early, avoid them, or if you can't avoid them, you recover from them quickly. So let's dive in and talk about some of those. The first one I see, and this is safety is not alone in this regard, but when you put it in, in a silo and it's sort of safety, that's the safety folks problem. No, it can't be. You are the experts in this area. You are going to be the evangelists in this area. You've got to really know what's going on, but you can't solve all this. You, safety outcomes are the result of the behaviors of people throughout the organization, not just those who work with you. So, the people again, who I've seen to be very effective, they look at themselves, safety is almost a connective tissue within the organization. They're building bridges. They're looking to say, okay, how can we help improve business results? How can we help the company attract better and retain better talent? How can we help with customer relations? That you're building bridges all the time because you can't solve the safety problem by yourself. There's no way, you're not there all the time. You're not doing every task. So you've really got to be, again, attending to those relationships. And so this is where it's important to both listen as well as tell. And again, a, a mistake I've seen is people who go out and like, okay, we're here, we'll put the posters up, we're going to come give you our, our, our talk on safety, and then we go away. And because you've broadcast it out, you think things are going to change. No, safety is much more of a collaborative effort if you're going to truly lead. And that means listening to people, finding out what's working, what's not, where is improvement possible. Those frontline perspectives can really be, really be helpful, both in terms of improving your training, spotting uh, risks you may not be aware of, um, and just finding out better ways to fine tune what you're doing. So it requires listening as well as talking. And then look where the gaps are between departments and different parts of your organization. Again, it's one of the places we see things fall down is when they're the handoffs from one, from one unit to another, one shift to another. Be looking for where, where can you help build those connections and keep the, uh, keep the relationship strong. So you don't want to destroy your silo because your specialized expertise is really, really important. But you can make it a silo that's heavily connected and intelligently connected across the organization. So think beyond the silo is, what is mistake number one you can avoid. Let's look at our next one. And here again, this is related to the first one, but where safety is not really part of the culture, but it's of an add-on. It's okay, we have to do this. It's a compliance function. Uh, we try and minimize the cost and minimize the time devoted to it and then expect good things to happen. They won't. It's really going to become part of the culture. You know, one of the, or I worked with a global organization in a high risk industry, and they were outstanding at building it into the culture. So, you know, no meeting I ever went to started without a safety briefing. Uh, no matter when it was with, with whatever part of the organization, even if it wasn't with the, the EHS folks, there was a safety brief, briefing every time. When they looked at their organization to say, where were the big risks? Number one risk was uh, automobile accidents. Those were the, where they were getting injuries and fatalities. And so they tackled it not just uh, within the company, within w using company vehicles. They actually set up protocols if, you know, seatbelt wearing in a private vehicle or in a, a taxi or a lift or one of those kinds of vehicles. If you were caught not wearing a seatbelt, it was a firing offense first time, no matter where you were in the organization, and they, they enforced it. They looked at every single way they could improve driving safety. They tracked it, they measured it, they uh, reported on it, 
and it really became part of how they thought. And so it was not sort of, okay, we, you know, we have to follow these rules. So that's why we're going to do it. No, it was, Hey, we are a safety focused organization. The organization cares about us and we have to care about each other. And it was, became a point of competitive differentiation, not just a way to try and uh, maintain regulations. So building it into routine, you know, again, when I've been in uh, folks in the energy sector, who hold the handrail every time they go up and down stairs. You know, even if they're in an off building where the risk is relatively low, they know that if you do that on an offshore rig and you slip, you're probably going to get seriously injured or, or die. Uh, and so it becomes part of the thing. When they people came to visit me on campus, they're holding handrails everywhere they go. And so make it part of that routine, build it in. So it's become how you part of how you think and part of how the, the organization sees itself. And that's how your people will begin to see themselves. And that's when you get a really vibrant safety culture. Next up. And again, data, we now have so much data, it's important to, to draw on the data you can, make sure you're measuring what matters, reporting on it, making sure people see it uh, and attaching it to organizational outcomes, be that you know production, uh, revenue, whatever it happens to be the organization values, connect the safety data to it. So don't just, you know, stories are great and you want to have good stories to illustrate your data, uh, but don't just rely on anecdotes alone, or we've seen a, a lot of, or we got a ton of this. Actually be able to look at the data and say, we here's why we think what we think, um, and here's what we know. And so use that to determine what's most important for you to address. It helps you make your case to uh, the senior management as to why you're spending the resources where you are and why you need the, need the resources you're asking for. And then look and see what are the consequences when things go poorly, when you've got you know days lost or people who are no longer there uh, for long term because of long term disability or fatalities or other other causes. You know what's the impact on the organization? Senior executives tend to think in terms of numbers and data. So you've got to do that alongside them. Again, have the stories to capture the imagination, to illustrate your points. That's important too. But have the data there. The company I mentioned earlier about, about the uh, with looked at uh, driving as the, a primary risk. They had identified that by looking at the data. And then region by region around the world, they had identified what's the rate of accidents, how many days, uh, how many trips taken safely, et cetera. They could report on all of that. Every manager was held accountable to it, accountable for it as part of their quarterly review. And so it became really, really important. You can compare one region to another, and it became a way, again, of people really seeing in a clear way what was happening and why you were doing what you were doing. So make sure you're pulling the data together. There's more and more capability now to analyze it and bring it into a compelling picture that will help not just reporting up and, and leading up, but also across and beyond. People will understand the impact that safety can have. Positive safety, I really believe, has a positive impact on the organization. It's not just avoiding negative consequences. It is how much better we are, how much more productive we are when we're focused on safety, because it means people are doing things right, taking the time to think things through, making fewer mistakes. And that, in the end, is going to, travel, is going to translate into bottom line results. Next slide, please. Now let's think about some the crisis leadership mistakes. And I've had the privilege to say during Deepwater Horizon, I was uh, I've deployed to multiple disasters and, and work with crisis teams around the world. And again, we've seen a, a, some common mistakes that can, that are made, but fortunately, there are ways to avoid them. And when I talk about leadership here, again, this is not uh, separate from operational, where you're looking at sort of the tactical piece, which is critically important, knowing what to do. The crisis leadership mistakes is all about how to think, how to bring people together, how to make sure they are focused in the right area, working well together, and getting you to that best possible outcome. So let's look at our first one. I mentioned earlier, we look at neuroscience as one of the places we get our insights from. And one of the things we know happens to every human being, in fact, every animal on the planet has an instinctual response to threat. We call it the emotional basement. Others call it the amygdala uh, response, amygdala hijack. It's your triple F response, freeze, flight, fight. Whenever you are faced with a threat, and that could be again, an industrial accident, it could be someone cutting you off on the highway, someone dropping a lawsuit on your desk, anytime your brain senses a threat, the part of your brain called the amygdala fires up, shuts everything down except your survival instincts, freeze, flight, fight. 
that's not a good place to be leading. It's not a good place to be making decisions. It's not a good place to be addressing the media or talking to your staff. You've got to get out of the basement. The way you do that is by giving yourself something to do that you know how to do. That's how you're going to reassert your self-regulation and, and, and emotional intelligence. So this is where your protocols and your checklist come in so handy. Something goes wrong, you go to that checklist, start doing step one, step two, step three. That sort of reboots your brain, almost like rebooting a computer, and gets you back into productive thinking. If you don't have a checklist, take three deep breaths. Count to 10. Anything you know how to do when you can demonstrate that, that agency, that self-competence, that will overcome that triple F response. You want to have that, take that deep breath before you go talk to your boss, your board, the public, because if you look rattled, if you look panicked, they're going to be panicked as well. We have mirror neurons in our brains, which means we, we, we mirror the behaviors of those we see. And so if you're calm, cool, and collected, others will be as well. So this is why you want to do this. And again, this language is so important. You can teach it to your teams, teach it to those around you. The emotional basement is something we, we all have. We all go there. We can all get out. So you can't avoid going there, but you can get out much more quickly than you might otherwise if you didn't know how to do it. And having that language is, is a less threatening way to have the conversation. You know, if you go tell somebody you're overreacting or you're being too emotional, those kind of things, they just the reaction they get tends to be even more emotional and more upset. You get sort of a threatening way to talk to people. But the emotional basement, hey, you're in the, I think you're in the basement, or I think I'm, I'm in the basement. That's a much more neutral way. It's based in hard science. It's much less threatening. It's a way, particularly if you have to tell someone more senior, I, again, I've been in rooms with CEOs and governors who were in the basement. And if you've got to tell somebody at that level that they're behaving badly, it's great to have a way to do that somewhat less threatening. And so this is why this is so, so important. Let's go to our next one. Here's a, this can be a tough one for folks in the safety field because we're so used to having our procedures and protocols, looking for compliance. We want to control, control, control. Instead, you want to focus on order. Why do I say that? Well, if you, when you go back after this webinar and talk, talk to your teams, talk to your peers, ask them how many would like to be controlled. You may get one or two hands going up, but not very many. But ask them how many like order. That is, you know what to expect of others, and they know what to expect of you. Almost everyone likes an orderly environment. So when you focus on order, what you want to do, first of all, if there's things you have to, you're supposed to control, control them and do a good job with that. But there are many things beyond your control. The public, the media, regulators, the government officials, all those folks are beyond your control. So don't try and control them. You'll make yourself crazy, and you'll wind up spending a lot of time doing things with no, with no real output. So instead, think, how can I inject order into this? You can do that by being credible and reliable. Even things as simple as if you give a briefing at 1 o'clock, say we'll be back with another briefing at 4 o'clock. and Come back at 4 o'clock and give a briefing. You may not have much new to say at that point, but now you've demonstrated I can rely on this person to come back when they say they're going to and tell me whatever's new. That helps contribute to order. Making sure everyone's got a job to do contributes to order. And when people have order and you've hired good people and trained them well, they'll be able to make decisions and act somewhat independently, but independently in a way that is aligned with where you want to go. They'll be able to exercise their best judgment, which means you don't need to micromanage. It means you can clear some things off your plate and begin to look forward. Now, some of the ways you can make sure you've got order is to make sure you're crystal clear on mission. What are we trying to achieve? Our values, our principles and protocols. When you can be really clear on those. I interviewed a number of uh, people in the field uh, toward the end of the last phase of the coronavirus. The, the coronavirus is the gift that keeps on giving, so we can never say it's over. But I interviewed people from big global companies, and it was really good to hear that um, most of the CEOs, their first reaction to this was, Take care of people. Make sure everyone's taken care of. I'll get to the business case later. If we got to do something, do it. We'll figure out how to pay for it. Just take care of people. There's one. When people are clear on values like that, they know to act. Okay, if I'm taking care of people, I'm doing the right thing. I'm doing what the company wants. That moves them in the right direction. So keep really clear, really be clear on that. It also gives people something to hold on to in a really in a chaotic situation. If I know what the organization stands for, if I know what you as the leader stand for, when you're going to back me up, what you're looking for, that makes it much easier to deal with the chaos outside. 
I have something to hold on to. I have some firm ground on which to put my feet as I'm dealing with all the other uncertainty. So try and keep clear on those things and people will follow you. And next up. And as a leader in safety, you've got to be thinking about the future and anticipating what's going to happen next. And what I've seen too often, the mistake is people get obsessed with what I call the thin edge of now, which is you put your head down, you, there's things that have to get taken care of right away, and people get stuck there. Now, as a leader, you need to make sure that the things that have to get taken care of right now, someone is taking care of that, and it's being take, handled well. But you need to be thinking, you know, be thinking forward. This is the pivot toward anticipation. Okay, if I see what's happening right now, what do I predict is going to happen next? What's my best case? What's my worst case? What's my most likely case? And if I want to get to my best case, what has to be true? Which then tees up your decisions you're going to need to make, maybe the operational assets you're going to need. You may need uh you may need some uh, top cover, permission from above for certain decisions. You need to know, okay, if we have to evacuate a plant or if we have to make stop production somewhere, you know, who's, who makes that call? You can begin to think ahead. So when you've got that best and worst case scenario in mind, you've got people who are building that out. You think back to what has to be true to get me to my best case. What am I work, watching out for in the worst case? And then you can begin to stay one step ahead. Because when, you're, when you start to get behind in a crisis, it's really, really hard to catch up. So we use a tool called the pop doc loop, which is taken off. And if any of you are Air Force veterans out there know the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act. We have a version, uh, expanded version we call the pop doc loop. And that is pop, perceive, bring in data, open your aperture wide, what's happening? Orient, look for the patterns. What does all that data mean? What's relevant? What's irrelevant? The second P is predict. What's likely to happen next based on that pattern? Because patterns tend to repeat. That's the analysis side of things. So think of this on a figure eight, if you would. So that left side, the pop is one, one circle. You're analyzing. Then you cross over to dock where you're starting to take action. D is for decide. You've got to actually make decisions to have things happen. But decisions alone don't drive results. You've got to operationalize them. That's the O in DOC. So who's going to do it? What assets do they need? How much time is it going to take? Ask those operational questions. And the C is for communicate. Make sure everybody knows where you're going, why you're going there, and what they're supposed to do. And this means briefing up to uh, senior management. It means make sure your team is aligned down. And then to the extent you're working with other, other parts of the organization, finance, HR, et cetera, have them aligned as well. Pop doc is something, it's, it's those six steps are the way our brains actually work when we're optimally processing information. So it's not like we made it up. We didn't sit here at Harvard and are behind the ivy and sort of come up with this, this cute little acronym. Uh, we actually talked to our neuroscientist friends and said, how does the brain work when it's working best? This structure, when you know, if you're facing a threat you have seen before, you may go through pop doc in a, in a second or less. I mean, it's something you've seen, you recognize the pattern, you know what to do, and you go through this really fast. When you're facing a novel situation, it's actually a great structure to slow everyone down, get them around the table and say, let's do a pop doc. Go around, get everybody on the same page, create that common operating picture. Then you can push people out to take care of their individual tasks, bring them back in in the two, four, six hours, whatever the cadence of the event calls for, and do it again. Let's get back on the same page. Where are we? Reperceive. Re -perceive. How's the pattern now? What's our new prediction, et cetera. And it gives you a real rhythm to your leadership and it really helps you stay, again, stay ahead of the, of the operation of what you're trying to get done and keep everybody on the same page. So pop doc sounds complicated, but it's a really useful tool. I know one, or, one large organization that uses a version of this, they have built it into a portal. Uh, so it's all online and it's how they brief everybody up, down and across uh, in the organization going through a series of these cycles. And it's a really, really helpful way to keep things organized. Eric, we have a question here. Can you uh, say what PopDoc stands for one more time, please? Absolutely. And I, po I apologize for going quickly there. I know it's a mouthful. It used to be called the pooped loop. So PopDoc is actually an imp improvement. <laughs> Good thing the neuroscientists found a couple more steps in there. Um, so Pop is, the first is perceive. Open that aperture wide. Try and bring out as much data in as you can. The O is orient. Where are the patterns? What in that, among that data, those data points? What's relevant? What's not? That leads you to the second P, which is predict. What's likely to happen next? And if you can, put some uh, assign some variables there, and, and so see what's most likely to happen. That's the analysis side of things. Then you cross over to the second side of the figure eight into doc. D is for decide. 
O is for operationalize, for carrying out those decisions, and C is for communicate, to make sure that everybody knows what's happening, what their role is, what they're supposed to be doing. And then you go back and do it again. After you've gone through one cycle, okay, let's reperceive, reorient, et cetera. And it becomes a really predictable cycle that keeps everyone on the same page. Okay, let's go quickly through our next two, and we'll go. We'll uh, look here. Failure to engage stakeholders. This is fairly obvious. Um, you need to have robust stakeholder mapping. New, know who cares about the situation in which you find yourselves, what their concerns are, how you can address them. The stakeholder you overlook will be the one who will become your biggest problem uh, as you go through any incident. So look for that, and also look for the secondary and tertiary situations in which those stakeholders are involved. And let's go to our last one. Pacing is so important as we have learned through the coronavirus. Not everything is a sprint. So here you need to be, again, as you're forecasting and you're making those predictions, how long do we think this is going to last? Not, you know, we all have physiological and psychological limits. So you want to be thinking about how do we offboard, onboard, offboard, onboard, offboard people through that crisis team. So you're always at full strength, but you're giving people a break. So you want to rotate through there. It keeps people stronger, longer. And that's what you're trying to do in a crisis is make sure everyone's at their peak performance for as long as possible. Normalize coming on and off of that crisis team. So it isn't like, oh, you know, Jane's wearing out. We better take, you know, better remove her for a while. Make it a regular rhythm so everybody can, if there's no stigma to being taken off the team or being brought onto the team, and it really will serve you well. So I hope you, these, these, uh, Mistakes have helped you. I think more important is how to avoid those mistakes or how to recover from them quickly. And you will do, you'll be a fabulous safety leader. Eric, wow. Thank you so much for that information. You explained it so articulately. So we really, really appreciate that. And now it's time to move on to our highly anticipated Ask an Expert portion of the presentation. So just a reminder, you can sub submit questions using the Q&A box if you haven't already, and we'll get to as many as we can. So Peter, do you want to maybe kick things off for us? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Eric. That was fantastic. Um, as Katie mentioned in the beginning, we got a tremendous number of questions that came in, more than we normally ever get. And what we did, instead of just going through all of them one at a time, we decided to categorize them. It seems like there's about five or six key categories. Uh, the first one was all about culture. Uh, so how do we improve our safety culture? So I've got some questions I'll ask Eric there. Then it's all about buy-in. How do I get both leadership and the employees to better buy into what we're trying to pitch here and have them do? Uh, then there's also questions around the theme of coaching or encouraging behavioral changes. Another theme around communication. How do we improve communication when it comes to safety and emergencies and things like that? Um, and then lastly is early career safety leadership or people coming in that are perhaps several levels down from the folks that they're trying to influence. And how do you influence them to uh, do something or influence change? Uh, and then there's a miscellaneous section as well. We'll try to get to as many of these as possible. Um, we could have had a, like a half day session on all this. There's a tremendous amount of great <laughs> stuff here. So sorry, we can't do that, but we'll cover as many as we can here in the next 15 minutes or so. All right. So with that, uh, said, um, Eric, let's go ahead and get started on the culture aspect of things. I'll kick it off by asking how does safety leadership affect company culture? Well, first of all, uh, thank you, and I and thank everyone for the great questions you sent in. There was a, it was a tremendous variety and, and many interesting questions in there. You know, I think when it comes to culture, uh, you know, culture is, um, you know, an organization every has not just one culture, often micro cultures within a large organization. Safety leaders can affect that culture; they can influence it through their be their own behavior, the behavior of their teams, and how they show up in the organization. As I mentioned earlier, if people show up just to the compliance, they've got the clipboard, let's tick the boxes. Um, that says, okay, we do with as little safety as we have to. When you come up wanting to, when you instead enter the room, understanding what the business challenges are and understanding how a safer a better safety culture can improve results, can help keep people safer, which which helps you with your talent because people are productive for more days. It can help you with customer engagement. It can help you uh, keeping costs low and also in some cases driving revenue it can become a competitive advantage. Think of it in those larger cultural terms and see where the organization's trying to go and how you plug safety into it instead of making it something gets bolted on from the side. And how do you go about doing that? What are some of the recommended steps to encourage a culture of safety to do the things you're just talking about? 
Uh, so <clears throat> part of it, as we mentioned, is looking at data and see where you can tie your safety data to the results of the organization where you can show that, you know, uh, a low incidence of, of inc a low number of incidents led and it was correlated with uh, better outcomes or where a high number of incidents was, was correlated with prob problematic outcomes is one way to do it. Tell stories, and this is where the stories are important, where there was a, either a particular unit that did something great or where an accident was avoided or somebody raised their hand and said, here's a potentially risky situation, let's deal with it. Don't just skim over those stories. Those are gold tell those stories and again help people realize oh i did never i didn't think of that in the context of safety but you're right it actually is and it help, begins to weave you into the larger context of the business so tell stories to the team to get them emotionally involved and then back it up with data to get the executive and budget buy in exactly and and know what those executives care about and then look to look to tie your safety information your stories and your data to those larger points yeah and I love what you said at the beginning, that safety shouldn't be its own silo. It should be a connective tissue of the organization. So this, this next question kind of helps segue us down into the buy-in side of things. But how do you keep employees motivated about safety? It can kind of seem like you're droning on after a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, 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 you can when you're talking about safety. But when you're talking about them and their health and their safety, now they've got a stake in the game. So I think that when you're looking at, uh, you know, and connected to them, why are we doing this? Not because the regulator says we have to, but because we care. We want you to be healthy. We want you to be productive at work. And we want you to go home to your family at night. And that's why we do this. When that's the overarching reason, it's much easier to keep folks engaged and also look for ways to when you tie it to their daily activities, when you can make the, your uh, your training and things more interactive and sort of less death by PowerPoint, uh, it becomes less like you're again you're droning at them than you're doing it with them, uh, and which become which will keep them much more engaged. Well, switching to leadership, let's say you're in an organization where you have some inexperienced leadership, especially when it comes to safety, and they put production first. How do you gain buy-in from them and change their mindset? Uh, well, one way is, again, back to data and stories. Have there been incidents where or times when a safety incident shut down a production line or cost you a customer relationship? Making sure they hear about that because those are true costs to the business. So, you know, I, I, again, I, you can't think of there's production or there's safety. There's production and there's safety. And mm -hmm. a positive, positive approach to safety should actually help you improve production because – People are going to be more productive individually. They're not missing days. They're not missing weeks from work. You're not trying to, you know, again, you don't have to replace people who are out for long periods of time. So that should all actually improve production, not detract from it. And this is another thing that we talked about at the beginning, and it was a question that came up quite a bit in the submitted questions, but resources are thin. So what do I do to best meet the safety needs of my people and my organization when my resources are so thin? Where do I focus? So I, I've yet to meet anybody who has all the resources they they want or need in a, in a safety role. It's just it's a perennial challenge. Um, so again, when you can connect it to people's individual activities, you want you want to leverage the individual the daily activities of everybody in the organization. That's what moves safety forward. So again, you can start with some small things. It may be that short safety briefing. It may be some things around driving safety or uh, other sort of routine tasks. But begin, you can then begin to engage them as your allies who will begin to move things forward and become uh, the amplifiers of what you're trying to do. So it's not only relying on what's technically in the safety function. Yeah, and it goes back to what you said before. It, it can't be a separate thing where someone comes in over the top. It's got to be part of the connective tissue, and that's the key there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So look for those daily activities. And again, those may not be your largest risks, but if you, if you have the opportunity in healthcare, getting doctors to wash hands and nurses to wash hands took, it, took a long time to make it happen, but now it's become very routine. And that's become a great way to reduce uh, avoidable infections and avoidable deaths in hospitals. So there's ways you can attack those everyday activities that begins to get everyone thinking about safety. Well, getting employees to buy in is pretty tough as it is, but what about subcontractors how do you get them to buy into safety uh well again if you've got a strong safety culture um you're going to want to be picking subcontractors that also have a, a strong sub a strong safety culture you also may be able to help them um one organization that i work with actually um, began to export their safety protocols and practices to their subcontractors they said hey let us send one of our people to you show you how we do it we're going to open book we're going to share how we do this because if we're working you know if, if you have a, a safety incident that's going to affect us 
even if it's in your your facility, your people, it still affects our overall business. So we're going to help you. And again, I think the stronger a safety culture is, the more you're going to attract individual employees who care about safety, you're going to retain them, and the organizations you work with, both customers and suppliers, who also care about it. You're going to have a, a common connection there. Yeah, I agree with that. We have a customer here at Alert Media and they're in the construction business and they basically hold safety as one of their highest values and standards and all their subcontractors know it. And they actually attract the top subcontractors because they want to work at a place where they know the company has their back. They do not want to go to places where safety is not prioritized. So it actually helps them become more competitive. So it's actually good for business, not just health and human safety. Absolutely. This, the companies that care about safety want to work together because they know they, they're, it's a self-reinforcing feedback loop. Yeah, without a doubt. Well, switching gears a little bit here, uh, let's jump into the idea around uh, how you can encourage behavioral changes. Um, this one came up. Uh, this question is, do you have any standard positive responsive to negative behaviors? Um, well, I think there are ways. You, first of all, you need to identify the behaviors you want to see. Um, and you need to model them yourself, have your team model them. Um, to, to, it decreases any stigma if they're perceived as a deviation from normal. Um, in some cases, you need to put an enforcement mechanism in. As I said, the one company where uh, failure to wear a seatbelt is a firing offense on the, f the first time. Uh, you only need one high-profile person to get fired before everybody gets that. Um, and I will tell you, I, I have not worked with them in a couple of years now because of, of the pandemic, not worked with them extensively. I pick that up. I've never not worn a seatbelt since. You know, I used to be good in my own car, but a little loose in a taxi, whatever. No, not anymore. Uh, and you, once it becomes you, the behaviors, once you begin to build, build a little bit of habit, people just go to it and they begin to see it. But if they see their peers, we look, you know, what's something called social proof is one way to influence people. And when you look around you and say, okay, everybody else is doing this. I better do it too. Uh, it becomes safer from a behavioral perspective to do that. And so you want to create those new norms, but know what the behaviors are. And if you, again, if you can influence a senior person or two to begin modeling that as well, that also will, will amplify your efforts. Um, and if you've got a safety champion uh, in, that, in that senior executive team, get them to start modeling it and it will it'll begin to, to, to catch on. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, that's super important. People have to see that the top takes it seriously, and they can't just hear, oh, do as I say, not as I do. You have to model the behavior. Yes, and you want positive reinforcement, not just negative. So not just people getting yelled at when they get it wrong, but, hey, I noticed you did this. That's terrific. Thank you. Or, you know, how did that improve how you're working today? And begin to get that positive reinforcement as well. Our brains love that. You get positive endorphins going up there when you get praised. Oh, without a doubt. I mean, there's a lot of psychological research that shows positive reinforcement is way better than negative. And that's actually one of the questions that came in. It's like, how do you get the best results when coaching bad behaviors? And uh, what's better to use? Consequences, rewards, and then how do those two things change behaviors? Right. And so I think where you've got truly high risk behaviors, you need to have consequences there. You have to have a low tolerance for that. Uh, but in general, you want to be building people so that safety is something positive, not something to be afraid of. And so build that positive reinforcement. Look for ways when things are done right. You can you can thank people. You can acknowledge them. You can recognize them. And then when you have to resort to consequences, you do it. But then everybody knows why you did it. And it becomes very clear why you did it. Well, switching gears to another section here, um, early career safety leadership, or as I mentioned before, not just early, but if you come in many layers down below people you're trying to influence. Um, so in this category, a question that came in is, I'm a young safety professional. How do I get seasoned, like really seasoned <laughs> workers on board with my initiatives? What do I do there? Uh, the, and that could be a tough one, right? When you've got very seasoned people with a lot, a lot of years of experience, we've always done it this way. Shut up, kid. It's not a big deal. Um, part of it is, um, you know, I, I find is letting that older or more experienced person explain to you why they do what they do, mm. which then if you're truly listening to that. And then you can explain back maybe why there's a different way to do it or a better way to do it. But, but if you just, just come in with, hey, I'm the, the safety person, I've got a better idea, um, that can encounter some, some initial resistance from people because nobody likes to be changed. But if, you, if I get you to walk me through, and I get to do this a lot when I get to you know, go into a new organization or an industry I'm not familiar with, and I just walk around and ask those naive questions. 
Tell me why you do it that way. What's going on over here? Um, and people have to explain it. And that gives you the opening then to be, begin a conversation. And when you can have the conversation, that's when you can really change behavior and change and change minds. So look not just to as a young person to be inserting yourself and trying to prove everything is you got the right idea. Listen first, and then you can weave that new idea in and you'll become less threatening and more of an ally. Yeah, that's great. It's classic Stephen Covey, um, right. you know, the seven habits of highly effective people seek to understand before you seek to be understood. And that goes yes. miles. <laughs> Absolutely. Never forget you have two ears and one mouth. That ratio is there for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good way to look at it. Yep. Um, what tips can you offer for leading your company's safety leaders from a subordinate position? How do you influence them? Um, again, listen, ask them what are the problems they are trying to address, what are the big challenges they're trying to figure out, and then see how you can help them do that. You may have a better insight into data and technology, for example. I mean, it's of a stereotypical young person thing that you know more about technology than the older folks, but there may be a way. Hey, I can help you figure this out. Um, hey, did you know we can, we can run some data that will help us better understand that problem? Um, that's a way to do it. I think when you, you, know, you always want to try and show up to be credible. So when you're talking, you actually know what you're talking about. You're reliable. Uh, you do what you say you're going to do. You show up when you say you're going to show up. You show you're invested in that larger mission. And you show you're willing to learn. Again, that's the way to open someone up to being able to – willing to teach is being willing to learn. As we just said, that you know, it's, again, uh, it's a riff on that, on that uh, Stephen Covey notion of uh, you know, seek to understand before you seek to be understood. Seek to learn. And again, build that relationship with those leaders. And then when they see that you're good and you're smart and you're listening, they'll be open to the ideas, you more open to the ideas you bring forward and the things you want to do. Very good. Well, there's a couple of questions here I want to bring out from the communications section that I talked about. And I think I might answer a couple of these. And if you sure. want to come over the top, that'd be great. One of the questions we got was, can you talk about effective communication and how we can enhance it? Uh, we could have a whole hour session on this, so I'm just going <laughs> to talk about a, a couple things that I think are really important. Anytime you're trying to communicate with people about safety initiatives or in the midst of a crisis, three things to keep in mind. Make sure that your communication is targeted. You want to make sure that you're not over or under communicating, like telling everybody about something going on when only 43 people should get the message. So make sure that you're targeting that message to the people who care, because uh, if you don't and you send it to a bunch of people who don't care, when you end up having to send the people uh, that didn't care about this one something they should care about, they're going to ignore it because they're, they're getting over-communicated. So be very targeted in your messaging. Second is to use multiple channels. Don't just send an email because not everybody reads email. Not everybody e reads email quickly you know, or ever at all. Uh, so think about what are all the different ways that I can reach people? Email, texting, voice calls. Can I set up web pages where I can share information? Maybe if it's critical, I send it out across all those other immediate consumption channels, but then let people know when they're ready and they have questions that go in depth, they can then visit that website. So multi-channel is hugely important to get a message across. Um, and then lastly is just make sure what you're communicating is appropriate. Uh, don't send too much information. Don't send too little. It's going to be different based on the situation. Uh, and make sure that you're putting the appropriate information in the right channel. If you're going to send a text message to someone, it should be just a quick warning, something they can consume in three seconds. Uh, but email, you could put a lot more information. A web page could have a whole lot of additional info. Think about the, the, uh, the medium um, as you're thinking about what you're going to communicate. And the last thing I would add there, Peter, is don't bury the lead, as they say in the newspaper business. Mm. Put that bottom line up front. Here's why this is important. Here's why you should care. And then give them the details. Don't wait till the fifth paragraph to tell them why that this is important because they'll never get to the fifth paragraph if you haven't done it already. That's right. No, that's a great point. Well, last one in the communication and section. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Katie. Yeah, I was going to say we have about two more minutes for questions. So Perfect. I, I got two questions. Uh, so, Eric, I'm going to ask you this one. How do we make sure workers who speak a different language understand safety protocols? I think that's a big one for a lot of folks out there. Absolutely. And one way to do that is ask them to explain it back to you. So don't just assume because you put it in their native language, they understood, they have understood it, but ask them to explain it back to you. Double check that comprehension. Uh, so go from broadcast to two-way communication. Excellent. And then we did have a, uh, um, a question come in today, and you talked about this a little bit before, but what personality traits are necessary 
to be an effective leader? And you talked about just listening and learning, but what else would you extrapolate from that or, or expound on that? Um, the effective leaders we see, it's not a matter of being an introvert or an extrovert. It's not a matter of any sort of exterior characteristic. Uh, it's people who are who are good learners, who are willing to surround themselves with really strong people who know a lot, who can challenge them, uh, people who are confident and who are highly emotional intelligent. Again, that emotional regulation we talked about, they understand themselves and others, and they can they can keep a lot of uh, a calm emotional tenor in the room. That's what really seems to help over time. Fantastic. K Katie, you sure we don't have time for 37 more questions? Because I got, I got that many more. <laughs> we, can, we can do this for a week, you know. We can make it a week-long course. Same time next week, guys. No. I apologize, everyone. Um, we, we can't get to everything. But Katie, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, guys. Yes, um, I do actually, I have some additional resources I want to share in that special treat that I mentioned. But I do have one last poll that I want to launch right now. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. If you could just take a minute, you know, you heard from our communication expert Peter today, one of our amazing partners, Eric. But Alert Media has a full team of experienced experts in safety, security, business continuity, crisis management. I could go on and on. So let us know if you're interested in learning more about how Alert Media can help your organization. You can let us know yes, and we will send you some information um, that you, I think, will find very helpful. Or you can say not at this time, no hard feelings. We'll catch you next time. So I am gonna give that just a few more seconds and then we will wrap it up. All right, so as promised, I have some additional resources here. So this was just the tip of the iceberg on safety leadership. So if you're looking for more information, first of all, we highly, highly recommend Eric's book. It's called Your It, Crisis, Change, and How to Lead When It Matters Most. And you can find that wherever you buy your books. We would also encourage you to visit NPLI's website. I, you could just Google NPLI, NPLI at Harvard University and you will find it. There's a lot of great info there on their leadership programs. And then finally, we have Alert Media's Emergency Response Plan template, which is a downloadable free template for building a comprehensive emergency plan. If you're interested in that, you can go to alertmedia.com. So the extra special treat, you may have already seen it in the resources section there of the platform, but Eric and his team have graciously offered a discount to all of you for their upcoming online program, Preparing to Lead in Crisis. So there is a PDF there in the resources section you can check for the program summary. It has a registration link that will activate the discount code. Um, and Alert Media is also going to email it to you after this webinar for your convenience. So Eric, can you give us just a super quick overview of that program and what the audience can learn from it? Absolutely. It's a deeper dive into several of the things we talked about today. It's six uh, two-hour sessions, all virtual, uh, but it's highly interactive and you get to meet some great people. We work through scenarios, so we do a bit of discussing the tools we talked about, but then we go and work the tools to make sure you know how to use them. And we do it all in a very uh, time-effective manner. Again, those six two-hour sessions over a three-week period keeps it pretty concise. We hope to see many of you there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eric, and to your colleagues at NPLI. So I do want to thank Eric and Peter for joining us today. If you do want to connect with them after this webinar, they are both on LinkedIn and are happy to connect with you there. So Eric, just one more time, thank you so much for being here. We really, really appreciate it. A pleasure. Thanks to you both and thanks to the audience. And Peter, it's always a pleasure hosting these webinars with you. So th thank you so much for your time. Indeed. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. Excellent. Well, that does wrap things up for us. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us. We hope to see you on a future Alert Media webinar. And of course, I want to thank EHS today for hosting us, being such a wonderful partner.